Okay, so we're back for the third and final portion of our uh, discussion today, and we'll get right to it. So let me go ahead and share my screen to the uh, missions tab here. Just one second, and there we go. And here we are. Okay, so automotive pollutants, sticking with that uh, subject matter of automotive pollutants, uh, very uh, important, especially here in the state of California. Uh, you'll notice that for automotive pollutants, many shops will take it upon themselves to, to repair vehicles that have, uh, have maybe failed a smog exam or have monitors on that didn't run and have failed a smog exam, have check engine lights due to a smog exam that they failed. Um, some of this might sound a little bit um, new to you or strange, but uh, you'll get to know more and more about this and a lot about the smog check program as we go. But a shop that is not a licensed smog uh, repair station with a, with a licensed technician um, cannot, is not supposed to anyways, uh, test and repair vehicles that have failed the smog check program. They have to go to a licensed shop. Many shops don't, uh, don't do that and end up getting in trouble. The shop can get in trouble and so can the technician. So um, be wary of that, okay? If a vehicle comes into a shop that's not a licensed smog check station, they may not work on the vehicle um, in relation to a failed smog. And, and those of you who work in shops, you're gonna notice that um, from time to time, they go ahead and take on that kind of work. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's a no-no. Okay, anyway, so let's go, let's get started with automotive balloons here. And what they want, what we want you to do here is again, write down on a piece of paper uh, uh, as the best answers you can think for the following question. So the question is, what are the few, a few basic causes, okay? Let me move my uh, picture out of the way there. What are a few of the basic causes for each pollutant created by the internal combustion engine? So think of what, what are some basic causes for hydrocarbons? What are some basic causes for carbon monoxide? Um, and what might be some causes for, for oxides of nitrogen? Okay. So thinking about that for a second, okay. Um, again, causes for hydrocarbons, causes for carbon monoxide, and causes for oxides of nitrogen. Okay. So, all right, so let's, let's, um, let's start here. And um, well, what I'm gonna show you here is actually just a, a on the fuel side. Okay, on the fuel side, if we have an air fuel mixture, and I'll talk about others right now, but just air fuel mixture, when we have a mixture that's too lean, okay, uh, not enough fuel or too much air, either one is lean, okay, remember that. Lean doesn't all automatically move, mean gasoline or fuel, okay? It can also uh, mean not enough or too much air, okay? Too much air can also cause that, like a vacuum, something like that. So too lean will cause increased NOx emissions, and you can, you can read down these yourself. Uh, can also get as bad as, as burned uh, valves, spark knocking, or ping, okay? That would be all from a lean condition. If it's just slightly lean, then, um, you can actually, you'll get low exhaust emissions, which is actually a good thing. High gas mileage, again, another good thing. But then look, reduced engine power. Hmm, nobody wants that. And then slight tendency to knock or ping. Stoichiometric, right? We already talked about that term, uh, which would be best all around performance and emission levels, okay? And you, you can argue that and you say, well, no, not for, not for like a for an, uh, high performance vehicle. And you're right, for a high performance vehicle that's been altered, you'd, you'd always want to run a little on the richer side, okay, like this, slightly rich, uh, increased CO emissions, increased HCs, maximum engine power, see that? A slightly rich condition will actually give you higher uh, power. So many times when vehicle people take and they um, um, will take and uh, add larger injectors or something to run more fuel, but remember, you add more fuel, you're gonna have to add more air as well, and your engine has to be uh, capable of uh, creating the proper compression. So uh, a richer condition will cause um, um, higher engine power. When it's too rich though, you're gonna get increased CO, increased HC, poor fuel mileage, okay? So this is the list that you can think of, okay? Um, what I wanna talk about real quick though, are some of the things that um, 
um, will cause um, um, high hydrocarbons. Now, let me switch to my um, to my other screen so I can kind of draw this out for you. And we'll go like this, and like that, okay, and like this, like that. Okay, so it's here like that. Okay, so um, let's talk real quick. Uh, let's get let's get the easy one out of the way. And we're just talking about three gases today, not five. Okay, next week we'll be talking about five gas analysis. This week is just three gases. So let's talk about real quick. Whoops. Let's let's talk about. Um, the easy one is CO. You guys remember what CO means? Okay. Um, carbon monoxide, right? Carbon monoxide, okay. And remember carbon monoxide is simply one molecule of carbon, one molecule of oxygen, okay. Um, the definition is partially burned fuel, okay. It, it, it did not complete, complete burning, but it started. It started the combustion process, but did not complete. Okay, partially burned fuel. I'm not gonna write that because my writing will be terrible, but partially burned fuel. So remember, when you see CO, what you should always think about, okay, when you see CO, the easy way to remember this, okay, that's why I expect you to memorize it today, right now, okay? CO will come from a rich condition, period, okay? A rich condition. What that means is either we have too much fuel or not enough air. Either one of those is a rich condition. So that's a that's an easy one to remember. Okay, CO rich. If ever you're you're diagnosing a vehicle for an emissions failure and you have high CO, it's a rich condition. Okay. But what I, um, what do I mean by a rich condition? Well, think about a rich condition. You can think of things like um, like an injector, right? A stuck open injector. So an injector, an injector that may be leaking okay or stuck open okay or maybe excessive fuel pressure okay excessive fuel pressure and that doesn't happen a lot but it does okay excessive fuel pressure but think about something simple what's what's a very very basic simple thing that can cause co remember too much fuel or not enough air Hmm, not enough air. What that brings to mind maybe is, think about it, think about it, wait for it. Not enough air. What about just a air filter, right? Hmm. What if, what, what about just a plugged air filter, right? A very, very dirty air filter. I've seen filters with, with, uh, with dirt and leaves and uh, I've even seen rat nests in air filters. So this is a very common one, right? We just, if you, if you get, if you get a, a customer that's neglected their vehicle and their air filter is dirty, guess what? You're gonna, you can have high COs. So that should give you a little bit of an idea, okay, of what can cause um, high COs. Okay, let me get this out here like that. And... Okay. All right, what about, um, what about, um, what about H, whoops. What about, let me give you this again. What about HCs, which are hydrocarbons? Hydrocarbons, one molecule of hydrogen, one mo molecule of carbon. So hydrocarbons, okay, which is totally unburned fuel, fuel that has not burned, okay? So the most common thing for, or the most common condition to cause hydrocarbons are misfires, okay? misfires. So a misfire, a misfire is simply, as the name implies, it missed the firing sequence. Okay, it missed the firing sequence. So the hydrocarbons, remember, they came in from the beginning, right? The Remember that the air and fuel came in at the beginning, and the hydrocarbons came through the engine, and it missed the firing sequence. So guess what? It came right back out of the tailpipe untouched. Okay, so a misfire is one of the most common causes of hydrocarbons, but there's also a couple more, uh, but there's, there's 
three categories of misfire. So it gets a little complicated, okay? There's three categories of misfire, okay? One category of misfire, hope you can try to think about it, one category of misfire is simply a ignition-related misfire, okay? That is spark plug not firing, the module not firing for whatever reason, an ignition-related misfire. Another type of misfire would be a compression-related misfire or, or engine mechanical-related misfire, okay? And then a third misfire would be a lean misfire, okay, where we have so much air that it does not fire at all, okay? Too much air does not fire at all. So three types of misfires, okay, that can attribute to the production of hydrocarbons. Okay. Now, one last thing I want to tell you about hydrocarbons, okay, is that you can also have hydrocarbons if you have an excessively rich condition. Okay. So remember, carbon monoxide only, um, only rich, but hydrocarbons can be caused by misfires of any of these categories, or hydrocarbons can also be caused by excessively rich conditions. But, so how do you know? How do you know if it's a misfire caused by uh, I'm sorry, a high hydrocarbons caused by misfires or high hydrocarbons caused by a rich condition? Well, the way you can tell is because if you have high hydrocarbons, okay, and they are associated with oxygen, you have high hydrocarbons and oxygen, it's going to be one of these guys, okay? Hydrocarbons plus oxygen, it's going to always be one of these. But if you have hydrocarbons and CO, okay, then it's gonna be a rich condition. So that's how you know, okay, simple as that. You can't have, you can't have CO and O2 at the same time. That's, that's impossible, okay? It's, it's chemically impossible. You can't have not enough air and air, right? So you can't have these together. If you have these two together, it's always caused by a rich condition. If you have these two together, they are caused because of misfires in one of these three categories. So HCs are easily the harder, are hard, are the harder gas to, uh, to diagnose. Okay? And um, for today, um, okay, and then, and then the other gas that we need to talk about, okay, is going to be is going to be NOx, okay, or oxides of nitrogen. NOx, okay, and I'll just give you the quick rundown. Uh, I don't want to get too far into it today. NOx is caused by high temperature, okay, high temperature in the combustion chamber, okay, high temperature in the combustion chamber, and um, it, this high temperature or high pressure, okay? But keep in mind, if we, have, if we have high temperature or high pressure, they go hand in hand. Or what a, a better way to put it is, high temperature will create high pressure and vice versa. High pressure will also create high temperature. Either one of these, okay? So anything that can create a high temperature situation, even a cooling system malfunction, okay? A lean condition, okay? or anything that can create a high pressure situation like, um, like a combustion chamber that's full of carbon, okay? Which, which, which leads to a smaller combustion chamber and then which also leads to a uh, higher pressure. Okay? So NOx are created by higher temperature or higher pressure. A real time uh, example of this is one that I said like the cooling system or another would be like I said, carbon being built up in the, uh, in the, in the combustion chamber or um, a lean fuel condition, okay? So that's your, your examples for your, uh, what can create uh, excessive, excessive uh, gases of either the NOx, carbon monoxide, or hydrocarbon varieties. Okay, so let's go back to our presentation um, right here. Let me make sure, did I, am I, uh, Here. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, almost to the end, guys. Hang with me, please. Okay, so as I said, there's your air fuel mixture chart. And then here is something that, um, that we're gonna look at next week, but this is a five gas analysis chart. Now notice that here in the center is your perfect stoichiometric. On the bottom here is your, is your air fuel mixture. Notice that 14.1, 14.7 is right at that red line. Anything on this side is leaner, as you can see by this arrow. Anything to the left is richer, okay? So this would be richer, leaner, okay? And this is optimum, right in the center, okay? Notice that we're representing five gases here, um, but let's look at the three we were talking about, okay? First, let's look at hydrocarbons. Here's, here's your line for hydrocarbons. Notice that the hydrocarbons line, notice that as we, um, hydrocarbons are lowest at this point, but notice that if we go slightly richer or slightly leaner, automatically hydrocarbons get out of control. Okay, get out of control. And then let's also look at carbon monoxide. Notice a carbon monoxide. Remember I said carbon monoxide, you only got to worry about a rich condition. That's true. Look, if we go lean, carbon monoxide stays low. But if we go rich, carbon monoxide raises up. Okay, raises up. Um, and then we have our, um, let me see here, we have also our, um, carbon dioxide, okay, carbon dioxide, and then we have our oxygen, okay, have our oxygen. Um, and real quickly, the reason that we worry so much about our gases and, and, and the gases that, um, that, that I want, um, want to discuss now are basically um, the uh, oxides of nitrogen and hydrocarbons, okay, because um, oxides of nitrogen and hydrocarbons, okay, remember, um, oxides of nitrogen and hydrocarbons, when they're mixed with sunlight, okay, create photochemical smog or just smog, okay? So remember, we need hydrocarbons, oxides of nitrogen, sunlight, oh, and I forgot one thing, and still air. You have those four components, okay? Again, hydrocarbons, oxides of nitrogen, sunlight, and still air, and you'll, you will have a production of smog. Okay, that's how smog is produced. Okay, okay so uh, next section here says write down on a piece of paper the best, uh, your best answers for the following questions. Um, what information can be found on an emission control label found on 72 and newer vehicles? Okay, so there's gonna be on Another thing we're gonna be doing this exercise uh, in, in the shop this week, this, uh, this week. So what information can be found? Think about some of the things can be found on the, on the information label on the 72 uh, and newer vehicle, okay? I know some of them you, you're gonna know right off the bat, okay? But you'd be surprised sometimes some of the things that are on there that we're, we might not know about, okay? So there's a distorted figure. But let's look at, see what we can find. So if you look at that hood label like this one here, okay, you're gonna find things like the, um, the certification, okay, the certification, this vehicle conforms to US EPA 2001. Notice this is, it's uh, passenger cars and California, okay? So this vehicle, this 2001 is designated as a California vehicle. That's important because uh, California vehicles will many times be built slightly different because of the uh, strict emission standards, okay? So that certification area, uh, the certification area is one of the things that you can find, okay? The other is the engine family, okay? So the engine family here was a 2.3, and then here's a code, okay? Here's a build code, okay? But it's a 2.3 liter. That's how we can find the engine family. Certification, engine family. Next is the uh, emission, uh, the emission, emission applications, right? What kind of emissions does this vehicle have? Well, this vehicle has a three-way converter. It has uh, two heated oxygen sensors, has an EGR, 
It has sequential fuel injection and it is also OBD2 certified. Okay, so the emission control systems. Okay. We also have the uh, engine specification or tune up area. This thing, this one uh, apparently has a valve lash adjustment. Um, it also gives you a spark plug gap and it says no other adjustments are needed. Okay, so apparently it doesn't have any adjustable timing or anything like that. So those are our four sections. And then last is what we call here our bonus section. And this, on this case, it's a vacuum, vacuum line routing information, okay? You guys, when you guys are, look, are working on a vehicle and you're gonna find information that you, for off the label, do me a favor, just automatically take a picture of it, okay? Don't be straining your necks under the hood, trying to find it, just take a picture of it, use it, and then delete it, okay? Um, or keep it, I don't care. But, but um, you know, just, just uh, make sure that that's the way we investigate. And it's very important because we have to find the, make sure we're, we're looking at the right vehicle when we're looking up information. Okay, so those are your areas that you're gonna find information on the underhood label. Okay, they are, again, the, um, the bonus area or vacuum line, which, that was, which was that one. Then you're also gonna find your engine specification area. You're gonna find the engine emission control area, engine family and certification. Okay, one, two, three, four, and then five. We, this one is, um, uh, is many times separate from on another label, okay? Still under hood label, but on a separate label, okay? Moving on. Okay, now what, what I want you to write down are the seven major emission control systems what are the seven, seven major emission control systems that can be installed on a vehicle? Okay. Think about it. Emission control systems. Okay. So there's seven. And here we go. We have the PCV system, the air injection system, the thermostatic, thermostatically controlled air cleaner system, the evaporative emission control system, the exhaust gas recirculation system, the three-way converter or two-way converter, okay? OC means oxidation catalyst, TWC means three-way catalyst, okay? And then we have computer controls, okay? Rounding out our seven. So those are our seven Emission, um, emission control systems, okay? These are our seven emission control systems that are found in the vehicle. Now what we're gonna do is, we're gonna, we're gonna write this in your opinion, what purpose does each emission control serve in cleaning up our atmosphere? So each one of these has a job to do, okay? And you can pretty much think about it as how do they line up how do they line up to those three gases, okay? Right, because that's what we're trying to clean up. We're trying to clean up those three gases, um, hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, and oxides of nitrogen. How do these line up to those three gases, okay? So, and there it is, okay? PCV, it, uh, it recirculates the vapors, okay? So you can say that PCV actually will help to clean up hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide, okay? Air injection, it adds air into the exhaust to help, to help the vehicle burn the exhaust better in the catalytic converter. So the air injection also hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide. Okay, keep up with me, please. Thermostatic air cleaner, you're, the chances of you seeing a thermostatic air cleaner on today's vehicles is few and far between. Uh, thermostatic air cleaners were used on carbureted and throttle body systems, so they are pretty much history. I, I have a couple of them in the, in, the, in the classroom. The only reason I mention it is because there are still some of these vehicles in the smog check program. So what this does is that it helps heat up the air when it, when it comes into the engine. Again, carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons. Okay, thermostatic air cleaner, hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide. The evaporative emission control system, it helps to recirculate the vapors from the gas tank. So this, the EVAP is strictly hydrocarbons, okay? EGR, what gas does the EGR um, help to reduce? That would be NOx, okay? 
it helps to reduce it by cooling off the um, cooling off the combustion chamber. The calorie, uh, the cat or calorie converter, it depends. If it's a two-way cat, it will reduce hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide. If it is a three-way cat, it will reduce hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, and NOx. And then finally, computer controls um, provide to get the vehicle back into um, for drivability, emissions, economy, and performance. And they also many times assist these other systems, right? We have computer-controlled EGR, we have computer-controlled EVAP. So the computer controls assist in all of these areas, okay? Moving on. So computer controls, on the topic of computer controls. Uh, what three principles do all computers use to operate? All computers use three principles. Think about this for a second. What do the computers do? All computers work the same. All computers have inputs, okay? Inputs um, would be an example of an input would be a sensor right? An oxygen sensor, a throttle position sensor, an engine cooling temperature sensor, okay? They provide information. They can't do nothing, right? All they do is they provide information and typically in the form of a voltage signal. Okay? So they input and they process, okay? The, com the, the computer control systems process. They take the information, they compare it to data tables that 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 gives them instructions, okay? Um, and they, they command an output, okay? An output is a component that does something, right? Also sometimes called an actuator. So actuators are things like solenoids, relays, injectors. So what does a computer do? It inputs, processes, and outputs. That's it, okay? That's exactly what a computer does. When we're diagnosing a computer control system and we think that it's a, it's a computer problem. We just have to ask ourselves, well, is the information getting to the, to the computer? Is a computer processing it? How do we know that if it's processing it? Well, because it'll come out with a correct output, okay? It'll come out with a correct output. So again, try to keep this as simple as we can and not, uh, not overcomplicate things and, and it should be um, a little better to understand. And then we ask, uh, what is an engine tune-up? I'm just gonna leave this up to you. We can discuss this tomorrow or in class, but what is an engine tune-up? Um, you know, we see it advertised all the time, engine tune-up. Uh, people, people will say, oh, uh, change your spark plugs and everything else. It, yeah, it is, that, that's the way we advertise it. But basically an engine tune-up is meant to restore the vehicle, okay, back to D, right? It's, it's a, it's meant to restore the vehicle's drivability, emissions, economy, and performance. How do we do that? Well, many times it's by, many times it's by uh, replacing components, but sometimes it's simply um, uh, getting to uh, back to specifications. Okay, what were the specifications? Today's vehicles don't have a lot of adjustable types of uh, um, accessories or components that don't have timing adjustment anymore. Very few have air fuel, uh, air fuel mixtures that are adjustable. But what we do is we check to make sure that the computer control timing is within specifications. We check to make sure that the idle speed is within specifications. And we check to make sure that the uh, air fuel ratio is within specifications. And if it's not, then we find out why. Okay, that's actually what a tune-up is, right? Making sure that specifications are being met. All the other extra maintenance, yeah, we'll call it a tune-up, but that's not the main purpose, okay? The main purpose of a tune-up is to make sure that the vehicle is as close as it can be to, to manufacture specifications, okay? Always remember that. Okay, oops, my bad, sorry. Okay. And let me see here. I'm making a slide or two. Give me a second here while I get this in order. Um, let me get this under.
Yes, this is the one I wanted. So this one here. Okay. All right, so it says here, it says each of you have taken the engines class. What does this waveform represent? Okay, what does this waveform represent? Well, what this waveform represents is actually a visual representation, okay, of the four stroke cycle. This is the way we're gonna be looking at engine compression, okay, and running compression. We're gonna, we're gonna look at it the old way, the old fashioned way with a gauge, but we're also gonna be looking at it with a digital storage oscilloscope. And if you see here, just really quickly, this is, this is representation. These are the two peaks, right? Peak to peak. So this, this illustrates high pressure, high pressure, okay? So when, when is the engine at high pressure? Well, it's during, during piston in the up position with both valves closed, right? So this peak here represents the compression, okay? Represents the compression cycle, okay? Or top dead center compression. After top dead center compression, when the engine fires, then we're, this is, this is as the piston is being pushed down, okay? Because of the expansion of gases, or some people say explosion. It's not really an explosion. It's actually just a smooth expansion. So this is a four stroke cycle. So this would actually be, um, this would be uh, the power, okay? This would be the power stroke. When it gets to the bottom of the power stroke, and then it creates a slight amount of pressure. What do you think that is? After the, what comes after the power stroke? What comes after the power stroke? If you said exhaust stroke, you're right. It's the exhaust stroke. After the exhaust stroke, the um, valves close again. The piston is in the downward position. So now we're in the intake stroke. And then we start creating pressure again. We start moving up back to the power stroke and the cycle repeats itself. So this is a visual representation of the four strokes. Make sure you start looking at it. Because we always say, we always say intake, uh, intake, uh, um, compression, power, exhaust, right? But when we look at this representation peak to peak, we, we're actually looking at power, exhaust, intake, compression. Power, exhaust, intake, compression. And here's a visual representation. There's our, our power stroke, okay? There's our exhaust stroke. Here's a, uh, the valve overlap, okay? Or the intake stroke. Notice that, that, do you see the small portion there? That's the valve overlap. And then we have the compression stroke, okay? So that's basically it for this lecture. Make sure you finish your, uh, let me just make sure I, oh, that one last thing, one last thing. So the vehicle identification number. I knew I forgot one thing. Vehicle identification number. What you need to find out for this is, for the vehicle identification number is, um, what information can be obtained from knowing the vehicle identification number? So uh, you can use all data or whatever, find out um, information that's in the vehicle identification number. You should be able to fill out, I believe I put seven boxes. I put seven boxes on your worksheet. Make sure that you fill out at least those seven boxes, okay? Um, and like I said, um, when, you're, when you're done, you're gonna upload it and turn it in. Okay, so um, I will talk to you uh, at our next live lecture or on yeah, campus. That concludes the third and final lecture for this first part series of the engine overview. Uh, thank you for your attention.